next person on is the wonderful uh, Mr. Mark Hornick. I'm really hoping he's there. Yeah, he's, he's a few te- I am here. Yeah. Hey, we've had a few technical issues today, Mark. So we've, <laughs> schedule's gone out the window a little bit. We, me and Roger have been uh, emceeing at a whole new level today. So um, good to have you with us, my friend. I, I can see very, here. very snowy in the background, shall we say. Yeah, we've had a bit of snow. Uh, today is warming up nicely, though. Yeah, so uh, as per our previous discussion, it looks like our fun fact about you is that you've moved from gardening to snow blowing. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, trying to to get outside a little bit more as well. It's it's uh, We've had some good weather recently. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, I mean, we, wow. we won't mess around. I mean, I think um, at this stage, um, as Abby and I, as we continue to talk more and offend more American speakers than we should, um, we uh, would love for you to tell us, I mean, I, should, I suspect actually this follows on very nicely for what Anne Billy was saying about what's coming and what's new. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Much appreciated, sir. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I mean, it was great to follow Amberly's uh, presentation because, I mean, one of the things that we have is an integration with um, the uh, Oracle Analytics Cloud. And so the models that you build in Oracle Machine Learning can be used in combination uh, with uh, OAC. So it's it's really a nice, uh, nice follow on there. But, you know, in this session, uh, the focus is going to be on some new features for Oracle Machine Learning and also a peek at some of the roadmap uh, features for 2022. So as I was introduced, I'm Mark Hornick with Oracle Machine Learning product management. And uh, since I'll be uh, speaking about uh, some of our roadmap items, this is Oracle's standard safe harbor statement, which if you've been to other Oracle presentations, you're probably quite familiar with. So, you know, for our agenda, uh, we'll start with a quick overview of the Oracle machine learning components and briefly discuss OML's role, uh, the converged Oracle database, and then our roadmap through 2022. And I'll also you know, highlight some new features that we introduced this year, along with a couple of uh, demonstrations. Now, in case you're not familiar with uh, Oracle Machine Learning, here's a quick review of the OML product family, and then I'll dive into our roadmap and the, the new features. So Oracle Machine Learning, as you might know, provides interfaces for machine learning in the database for three popular languages, SQL, R, and Python. And OML for SQL provides a SQL interface to the in-database parallelized algorithms. And this keeps the data under database control, eliminating the need to extract data to separate machine learning engines, which can enable scalability and reduce overall complexity. Now, the result, uh, resulting machine learning models, uh, which are, by the way, first class objects in the database, they enable batch and real-time scoring directly from SQL queries and provide explanatory prediction details so you can understand why an individual prediction was made. Now, OML for Pi and OML for R are Python and R language interfaces, respectively. And these allow you to manipulate database tables and views using familiar Python and R functions on data frame proxy objects. Uh, built on top of OML for SQL, uh, are the Python and R language interfaces to the in-database algorithms. Now, OML for R and OML for Pi also support embedded execution, where users can store user-defined functions in the database and invoke them through database spawned and controlled Python or R engines. And in OML for Pi, we have a Python a uh, API that supports automated machine learning or AutoML. Now, for interaction with autonomous database, we provide OML notebooks with SQL and Python interpreters. Users can schedule notebooks to be run automatically, and notebooks can be shared in a variety of ways with other users on the data science team. Oracle Data Miner is a SQL developer extension for creating, scheduling, and deploying analytical workflows through a drag and drop user interface. Oracle Mean Machine Learning for Spark provides machine learning on big data service with native scalable algorithms as well as Spark analytic algorithms uh, included in the same framework, all from an R interface. Now, next comes Oracle Machine Learning AutoML UI. And this is a no-code user interface that automates model building, selection, and deployment, taking advantage of the AutoML functionalities that is also in the Python API. And finally, Oracle Machine Learning Services 
is a RESTful service for model deployment and management, along with cognitive text analytics. So users can deploy a model from the AutoML UI directly to OML services in just a few clicks. OML services supports application development using REST endpoints. So with this quick introduction as our basis, let's look at this in the context of uh, the converged Oracle database. So Oracle Machine Learning fits well with Oracle's converged database strategy. Now having Oracle Database as a data science platform really involves more than just supporting machine learning algorithms. Oracle's converged database places machine learning and other essential technologies like, of course, query processing, but spatial, graph, JSON, uh, blockchain, and others at the fingertips of data scientists in a single, secure, integrated platform. So while expanding uh, data access and sharing for data professionals. Now, we know that crafting a solution involving multiple single purpose databases suffers from increased complexity. You've got more components and also in the component interactions. And you have growing integration and maintenance costs with such a solution. Now, further, you know, end to end security, availability and scalability can be inconsistent and limited by the weakest of the multiple single purpose databases used in a solution. So Oracle's Converge database eliminates these issues for a wide range of technologies, including machine learning. Further, you know, these converged technologies are included in the core database at no additional cost. So with that in mind, you know, here's a high level summary of the 2021 OML releases and a sample of features that we've planned through 2022. Now, looking at the, the previous year, we released OML for Pi, uh, OML services, and the AutoML UI uh, in the early part of 2021. And some of these have been introduced in past TechCast events, so feel free to check out some of those. But in response to customer feedback, we also enabled features of Oracle Data Miner, an autonomous database, giving users access to the popular no-code drag-and-drop user interface to data stored in autonomous database. Coming soon, we'll be releasing the OML for Pi on-premises Oracle Database 19C, along with a standalone, what we're calling a universal client. And I'll talk more about these later. On autonomous database, we're supplementing the embedded Python execution REST API with a corresponding SQL API. You might recall that embedded execution allows running user-defined Python functions in database spawned and managed Python engines. Now, we'll be updating OML notebooks to have the notebook repository in the user's autonomous database instance. And this enables database instance specific backup and restore of notebooks, as well as cross region autonomous data guard features. In case you're not familiar with it, Oracle Data Guard ensures high availability, uh, data protection, and disaster recovery for enterprise data. For Jupyter Notebook users, when it comes to import and export of notebooks, you'll soon be able to export your Zeppelin notebooks as Jupyter Notebooks. You can already import them. So later this calendar year, we're updating OML for R151 to be compatible with R release 405 for the Oracle database. And we'll be releasing a new Oracle R distribution in support of R405 as well. Now on autonomous database, we plan to add the ability to load third party Python packages for use with OML for Pi's embedded Python execution and OML notebooks. Third party package support is already available for OML for Pi on Oracle database. And this feature will allow users to leverage the broader Python ecosystem with autonomous database. OML for Pi on ADB will also be enhanced to support datetime data types. Now, when it comes to OML services, we're adding support for in-database batch scoring using the same REST API as for singleton and small batch scoring, doing this at scale in the database. And also we'll be adding an R interpreter to OML notebooks in support of OML for R. And this further enables autonomous database as a data science platform supporting SQL, Python, and R, the main languages being used for data science. Now, we also expect to see a new monitoring interface on autonomous database for data and model drift detection. And I'll talk more about that later in the session. 
Coming later in 2022, our plans include augmenting OML for Pi to programmatically deploy in database models to OML services, APIs for new algorithms that we have in the, in the database, and some transparency layer enhancements, including data preparation and statistical methods. We'll be adding the ability to schedule experiments in the AutoML user interface. And this supports automatically rebuilding models using the same jobs interface that we have for OML notebooks. We'll also be augmenting AutoML to support automated anomaly detection, a much requested uh, feature, in addition to the currently supported classification and regression. Now, not listed here, but equally important, are our ongoing integration efforts with, as I already mentioned, Oracle Analytics Cloud, but also uh, Oracle Data Integrator, OCI Data Catalog, and OCI Data Science. Now, you know, since we can roll out enhancements to the cloud services more frequently, uh, here's a summary of the, a few of the new features and resources that we've introduced. In OML services, we now also support Onyx format clustering models and cognitive text analytics for the Italian language, which adds to the languages already supported, English, Spanish, and French. We're considering additional languages and scheduling them as uh, resources and demand dictates. As noted earlier, OML Notebooks enables the import of Jupyter uh, Notebooks, and we've also expanded the set of example notebooks to cover a range of in-database uh, algorithms uh, that are available in OML for SQL and OML for Pi. Oracle Data Miner, as I've noted, is compatible with autonomous database. Check out Sherry LaMonica's recent OML blog post for details on setting this up. The link is included here on this slide. We've also updated the pre-built explicit semantic analysis Wikipedia-based model, supporting, for example, text feature extraction and text similarity. And you can download this model from the link shown here. And there are other enhancements as well, but let's look at a few of these a little further. First is OML Notebooks. Now, OML Notebooks has been upgraded to Zeppelin 0.9, which is enabling import and export of Jupyter Notebooks. We've introduced new notebooks to cover the remaining algorithms supported by OML for Pi and OML for SQL, along with the new 21C algorithms for XGBoost and MSET. You can also see how to load data into your autonomous database instance directly from GitHub. Now, many of the notebooks include descriptions of the settings available for the algorithms that we have available, and you can also see how to use SQL to score data and get prediction details for models created using OML for Pi. Here's the full set of, of notebooks that we currently have available. And some of the new ones for OML for Pi include dimension, uh, dimensionality reduction using SVD and uh, feature extraction with explicit semantic analysis. And for OML for SQL, using the new 21C algorithms such as uh, MSET for time series sensor data anomaly detection and XGBoost for classification and regression, among others. And you can find these in your autonomous database instance by clicking examples on the OML homepage. So let's take a quick look at uh, OML for Pi, uh, an example with that, using the in-database neural network algorithm for regression. Okay, so I'm looking at that notebook here, but let's see, how did we get to this point? So I'm gonna go back and uh, look at the examples that we have in the uh, template examples. And this will give us a listing here. And if I go just type in neural network, I'll get the summary, uh, the subset of neural, of, uh, neural network related uh, notebooks. Here we have OML for Pi regression. Now, if I click on this particular link, this is going to open up a read only version of that notebook. And it's been run. You can uh, view the results. And if you just want to do a, a read only inspection of that, uh, you'll be having that uh, available within a few seconds, and that's what we have here. Now, I'm just gonna scroll through this briefly, but let's see, can we instantiate this and make it editable and runnable? And the answer is yes. We'll go back to our examples and go back here. We're gonna click the tile for OML for Pi Regression Neural Network and create notebook. 
And this is going to create a, a one with an extension of one. If we create multiple instantiations, we'll get increasing numbers for that. But we're going to have this now show up in our listing of available notebooks. And then we'll walk through that briefly, give you an idea of what's uh, in there. So we'll go back to notebooks here. And let's click on the one we just loaded. So what's happening behind the, uh, the scenes is that it's uh, uh, starting up the uh, necessary uh, uh, interpreters and uh, loading the notebook for us to, to begin working. Now, when we get a new notebook, we wanna check to see what the interpreter bindings are. And this is saying, what is the type of connection that we'd like to have to the autonomous database? Uh, we're going to pick medium. Uh, basically, load uh, has no uh, parallelism enabled. Uh, medium gives us some degree of parallelism, uh, and high tries to allocate as much parallelism as possible, even limiting the number of concurrent users who can uh, draw upon uh, all of those resources. So we'll save that. And let's just scroll down to the first paragraph here. What this is going to do is when I click uh, run, that's going to start up the uh, Python engine in a separate container and uh, it establish the connection to the database. And that will take a few seconds to, uh, to run, but we'll be importing uh, the OML uh, package as well as uh, pandas, and that will take us uh, from there. The next step will be to prepare the data. So in this case, we're going to use the OML sync function and OML sync gives you a couple of options for creating these proxy objects that I mentioned earlier. What we want to do is get a proxy object to the data table that's in the database so that we can manipulate it through the Python API. So we're getting back a customer's proxy object based on this query. If I wanted to have the entire table, I can just say table is equal to table name. We'll get some demographics data, and then we're going to use the overloaded merge function to uh, construct the table that we want to use for uh, uh, machine learning. We can view some of the data using the overloaded head function and show that uh, here. Uh, we can further go on and say, let's prepare the data. Let's split it 60-40 in getting the train and test sets and then uh, split the predictors from the target, which is the uh, Python convention. And then we'll use that when defining our neural network model. In this case, we're going to first drop uh, the neural network model and then specify some settings. We're going to do a very simple neural network, just say, let's have one hidden layer with four nodes per layer and accept defaults for everything else. We'll provide our training uh, data, give the model name here, uh, NN neural uh, regression uh, model, and the case ID, uh, cust uh, which is the customer ID. And this allows for uh, uh, reproducibility of your uh, results because it will keep the ordering uh, more uh, consistent. Now, once we've built that model, we can see the settings, the computed settings, some global statistics that are available, as well as the attributes were, that were used for the model and the topology of our neural network. Included in some of the uh, notebooks are uh, the various settings that you can use with explanation of what they mean and how you can work with them. So for example, maybe we want to specify uh, as our neural network with a specific activation function. And we can just add to the settings that we had in the previous example and rerun that and we'll get uh, a new neural network in the database. Next, we want to say, well, I want to have a more complex uh, neural network architecture. Perhaps I want three hidden layers with eight, eight, and two nodes uh, respectively in each. And I have specific activation functions that I'd like to include as well. So I can explicitly uh, provide those here and rebuild our model. All of these models exist in the database and the object that we have in this case, NN mod, is going to be a proxy object to that in database model. And there are additional settings that we could uh, add as well, such as the controlling the number of iterations, a tolerance value, a random seed, uh, et cetera. Now, we can look at model fit statistics, we can display the weights explicitly, but you know, one of the things we wanna do with the model is to do prediction. And so we use the predict function on the model object, we we're providing our test data here and some supplemental columns from the original test data set because we'd like to see, well, you know, not only what was the prediction, but also uh, what was the original value and all of the other values associated with that. So now we have this score as a proxy object 
this exists as a view in the database, and we have the proxy object to that in res uh, df. But let's continue. So if we want to get some model quality statistics, we can invoke those using uh, the score function to get the coefficient of determination, R squared. Uh, we also have uh, the MAE, MSE, RMSE that we can compute all being done in the database on the proxy object uh, ResDF, and you see that here. Now, if we wanted to do some visualization, we can use the native Zeppelin uh, visualization capabilities, uh, in which case we're going to uh, end up retrieving the data points that we have, and then we'll show those using the native Zeppelin uh, uh, capabilities. But maybe we want to use matplotlib. And so here's how you can uh, do the same thing for plotting uh, your actuals versus predicted, as well as the uh, matplotlib for uh, residuals. And you see the, the resulting plots here. Now, I mentioned that one of the features of the in-database algorithms is this ability to uh, get prediction details uh, from the model predictions. So not only can we say the prediction, but what were the predictors and their values that most contributed to that prediction? Now, we enable that in the predict function by adding the argument top n attributes and set that to true. And in this case, we're going to see that uh, for our first uh, score, the customer year of birth is the most important, followed by uh, education, a uh, master's degree, uh, whether or not they had an affinity card and uh, other variables uh, as well. And finally, uh, we can do the same thing in SQL. So not only can you use Python to do scoring, but you can write a SQL query to use the model uh, that we created above, NN regression model. As I mentioned, it's a first class object in the database. And this will allow you to uh, get those uh, similar uh, results here. So for our customer, we can see the first attribute, second and third, uh, and what is contributing most to that prediction. OK, so let's go back to uh, our presentation. And we'll move on to OML services. So with the introduction of OML services uh, on autonomous database, Oracle is making it easy for data science teams and application developers to manage and deploy machine learning models using a REST API or uh, convenient user interfaces. OML services supports collaboration for model deployment, update, versioning, and scoring, and optimizes scoring performance for streaming and real-time applications. Now, by virtue of being included with autonomous database, no explicit VM provisioning is required for 24-7 availability. That means cost savings as well. The autonomous database environment manages the compute resources. Further, users just pay for the additional compute when producing actual predictions. Now, you know, users can deploy in database models from autonomous database and on-premises and DBCS Oracle databases. So it's not just a one environment or the other, it can be cross-platform. Also, uh, models produced separately from packages such as TensorFlow or PyTorch, among others, can be deployed in Onyx format. Now, OML services also supports cognitive text analytics for English, French, Spanish, and the recently added Italian that I mentioned earlier. Users can extract topics and keywords and perform text uh, summary and similarity, and in English, uh, sentiment analysis. Now, when it comes to deploying third-party Onyx format models, users can build ML models uh, elsewhere. For example, using Python in OCI Data Science or another Python environment. And these models can be, use, uh, can be built using a variety of packages and then exported in Onyx format. Using the REST interface, these models can be imported to OML services for use by enterprise applications, including applications produced using Oracle Apex. Now, Onyx, if you're not familiar with it, stands for Open Neural Network Exchange. It's an open format built to represent machine learning models. And it's more than just neural networks, however, unlike the name implies. So OML services supports machine learning techniques for classification, both image and non-image models, regression, and now the addition of clustering models. To illustrate uh, deploying an Onyx format clustering model in OML services, 
we'll first build a clustering model and export it in Onyx format. We'll use the breast cancer data set uh, from Scikit-Learn. And on the right, we've plotted two of the attributes colored by the target. So next, we create the clustering model. In this case, we're using Scikit-Learn's uh, k-means algorithm with two variables. We output the cluster assignments and display the cluster centroids. Now, the key step, though, is exporting the clustering model as an Onyx format zip file, which includes both the .onyx and the metadata.json files, as shown on the right. Now, once deployed in OML services, we can use the score rest uh, endpoint on the model to generate cluster assignments, uh, along with the distance from the centroid, and that's shown on the bottom right. So how did we get that model deployed to OML services? Well, uh, we first get a valid authorization token using curl. And then in the second curl command, we store the model by passing the model's name and version that the model type is Onyx and whether this is a shared model. We also specify the zip file that contains the Onyx format model and metadata. Optionally, we can specify a namespace for organizing models into groups. The result is a unique model ID. Now, once stored, the model can be used for real-time scoring in applications and dashboards. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, OML services now supports Italian. And this example highlights using the REST API for to topic discovery. We're using the topics endpoint and we get back the most relevant topics and their corresponding weight. So let's see this in action using the Postman interface, which is an application for API testing. It acts as a client that tests HTTP requests with a convenient graphical user interface. So we're gonna look at scoring using an in-database machine learning model, and then invoke cognitive text endpoints for Italian text. So here we're looking at the uh, Postman uh, user interface, and we have some environment variables set up for OML services, and you'll see you know, like a username, the token, uh, the model ID. So these are just names of things and values that we're going to use uh, in our various collections. And the first thing that we're going to do is look at the OML affinity models. So we're going to get a token. And the uh, grant type here is password. This is the body of the um, uh, invocation, uh, the REST interface. And you'll see that we have up here the um, OML server, which is going to be used, the URL for that, and the continuing with OML users, API, Auth2, V1, and that we're interested in getting a token. So we invoke this and the request will come back with the token that we can use. And it's valid for an hour and it can be um, re, uh, reauthorized for a period of time after that. Well, that's interesting, could not send the request. Let's try that again. It's specifically because we're watching it, Mark. Exactly. I mean, I've run this a dozen times already, and it's like all of a sudden it's telling me it's, ah, there we go. Okay, that's much better. So that's nothing cool. like a live demo, right? So we see the status. It's 200. Uh, took a few seconds there, probably because there was some other traffic that was there. But uh, we also see the response size, and we can look at these for some of the others. But let's do the uh, first thing to get deployment details. So again, we have our OML server. Uh, we've got uh, that deployment, and this is the URI for the uh, model that we're, we're working with. So we're just going to say, get us the uh, uh, deployment details. Now, in this interface, we can get, of course, back the JSON uh, content, and you see that we have the model type, who it was created by, uh, the model ID that I mentioned earlier, uh, the model name that's there, as well as that it's a classification random forest model. We see the attributes that were used for it. So we're getting all of this metadata about the deployed model. We also see the output, uh, what it is that we're trying to predict uh, by insurance, the labels, yes and no. And that you know we have a namespace that you can organize these by as well as say, is it shared so that other users can uh, leverage it as well. 
we've got the URI and when it was deployed. All right, so let's actually use this to score. So the first thing that we have here is uh, the body of this invocation where notice we have the uh, URI for the model and the endpoint score that we want. The top end details, we're gonna get back the uh, prediction details so we understand why the prediction was made. And then we have our input record. Now we can have multiple uh, input records in this space, but here we just have a single one. So we're going to run that. The first time we run it, it takes a little bit longer because it's uh, loading the model and um, uh, returning the result. But it, subsequent invocations will be, let's see, ah, 118 milliseconds, that's better. Um, that's what I expected to see. So the result that we have then is uh, no with a 98% and yes with uh, about one and a half percent. And then you have the details, you know, what is it that contributed most to the prediction uh, that was made? And of course we can visualize this, Postman provides a nice interface for it so we can see the label, uh, the corresponding probabilities, and this is a little bit easier to digest the, the column names and the corresponding weights uh, that contributed to that. And we can do the same thing for an SVM model. In this case, uh, coming back uh, here in about 115 milliseconds. So just driving home the point that this is intended for real-time uh, use in applications and dashboards. And we can uh, take a look at the model here. We have the version, the model type, who created it. All of this is available in that, uh, that metadata. And if we wanted to score using this one, we do the same thing. And we see that in the SVM case, it only gives us 84% uh, for this record and 15% in the case of one, but the prediction is still the same. All right, so that's scoring uh, an in-database model, but let's look at the cognitive text just briefly. So we have a number of examples here, but I'm only gonna run uh, the ones that highlight the Italian language, since that's what we were talking about as a new feature earlier. In this case, uh, we'll have some text that uh, is written in Italian, uh, but talking about Oracle machine learning. And one of the uh, endpoints is keywords. So we're saying, what are the top three keywords for the language Italian? And this is the text that we're providing it. Now this is gonna take a few seconds because it's doing some more uh, processing on that, but what comes back to us is uh, the uh, keywords or are the keywords that uh, result in this. So let's look at it a little bit more uh, easily here with this interface and we see the keyword and the corresponding weight. We can do the same thing for summary. In this case, we're going to pull out what are the sentences in this text that, most are, rep that are most representative of the text itself. And so we can see that as well uh, here and visualizing that uh, through the, uh, the markdown interface. We can also pull out topics for this. So in this case, we're asking for the top three topics. And in that case, we have uh, no surprise. It's the English words, but that's also what it's about. Oracle Corporation, Oracle Database, and, uh, and Big Data. So I hope that gives you an idea of you know, how you can use OML services and these endpoints then can be leveraged in applications and dashboards uh, to support this. So let's touch on the ESA Wikipedia based model for a moment, because that's actually um, the model that is supporting the uh, cognitive text in OML services, but you also have, avail have that available to you uh, directly for use in the tool. Now, explicit semantic analysis, ESA, supports both uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, with unsupervised feature extraction and supervised classification as we heard in the previous session. You know, as a feature extraction algorithm, uh, ESA doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't discover latent features uh, like LDA, but instead uses explicit features represented in a knowledge base, such as uh, Wikipedia articles, where each article is clearly labeled with a title. And for feature extraction, ESA enables computing semantic similarity of text documents, as well as explicit topic modeling. For classification, it supports categorizing text documents. So how did we do this? Uh, how did we build this model? Well, it's built, uh, the pre-built Wiki ESA model is, uh, is using millions of Wikipedia articles. 
with the topics reduced to about 160,000. So from that corpus of uh, data, we built this model. Now, of course, users can create their own ESA models that are tailored to their own corpus of documents which is likely industry or domain specific. So you can get uh, highly tuned uh, text analytics models. You can download the new ESA uh, Wikipedia model from uh, the page at the URL shown here. So a few comments on Oracle Data Miner. Some of you may be familiar with Oracle Data Miner. Maybe you've even used it. Uh, it's a user interface that's part of uh, SQL Developer. It's a SQL Developer extension that supports the creation of analytical workflows, serving as a productivity tool for data scientists and enabling citizen data scientists with a code-free machine learning environment that automates many common machine learning steps, such as data preparation, model building, model evaluation, and other steps. Now, Oracle Data Miner provides this functionality through an easy to use drag and drop interface where users connect nodes to construct analytical workflows. And users can then generate SQL code to enable workflow deployment or schedule workflows to run on a set schedule, which supports perhaps periodically refreshing models or generating batch scores. So Oracle Data Miner has always been compatible with Oracle Database on-premises and Oracle Database Cloud Service. And now it's available for Oracle Autonomous Database users as well. So let's move on to the OML for Pi Universal Client and Oracle Database 19C support. In the coming soon category, is support for OML for Pi on Oracle Database 19C and the OML for Pi, quote, universal client. Um, OML for Pi was introduced on premises for the 21C innovation release. However, with you know, many customers using the long-term 19C release, we're pleased to make OML for Pi available on 19C also. The OML for Pi universal client allows a standalone Python engine on Linux to connect to supported database versions, both 19C and 21C for autonomous database and Oracle database. So one package can be used to access each of these. And this is important, of course, for users who want to work with OML for Pi on autonomous database, but also take advantage of third-party IDEs and other notebook environments like Jupyter Lab. It further allows switching between on-premises and autonomous database instances using the same client package. Now, users can connect in a variety of ways using the oml.connect function, uh, either through explicit user and password or using an Oracle wallet. If you're not familiar with it, an Oracle wallet is a secure software container that stores authentication and signing credentials for an Oracle database. So you don't have to use clear text passwords in your code. Now, this client package uh, will also be made available on OCI Data Science in the coming months, so you can get in-database scalability through OML for Pi from that environment. So next is the SQL interface for OML for Pi on Autonomous Database. You know, for those of you who felt you'd get away without seeing any SQL code, I didn't want to disappoint. So here's an example showing the OML for Pi SQL API for embedded Python execution on autonomous database. On the left, we have the user defined Python function that builds a linear model from scikit-learn. And then it saves this model in the database using the data store and returns the model string. So this function is stored in the database Python script repository using PyQ script create under the name my linear regression model. Now on the right, we show invoking this Python function from SQL using the table apply functionality and the PyQ table eval table function. The system automatically populates the first argument dat uh, of uh, the user's function with data from the database table that's listed here. It provides this as a pandas data frame. And then we pass the iris table name, the user defined function parameter list, which includes the model name and the data store name. 
uh, we specify the output format as XML and the name of the function as stored in the Python script repository. Now, running this select statement results in a Python engine being automatically spawned, the function loaded, and the table data loaded as a pandas data frame in the argument DAP. When it's finished, you have a native Python model stored in the database that's ready to be used by another embedded execution invocation, or you could use it locally as well. But if you wanted to use embedded execution, you might choose the row apply uh, function. And this enables the use of system supported data parallelism to make scoring using this model scalable. Now, on the bottom right, we see the output after invoking the function, which is simply the value returned from the str function invoked on the model. And it has the value linear regression provided as an XML string. So the last item I'll touch on is a new feature uh, called OML monitoring. You know, the latter part of solution deployment involves data and model monitoring, where users can be alerted when data drift or model drift have occurred. Data drift involves identifying significant changes in the statistical properties of data, which may indicate the need to rebuild a model. You know, essentially, we start with some baseline data and compute an initial drift metric, and later we evaluate new data to see if the computed metric uh, surpasses our alert threshold. When new data is shown to deviate significantly, an alert is recorded. And this informs the user that rebuilding the model is likely warranted. Similarly, you know, model drift. It includes observing if the model accuracy metric is degrading over time. Again, suggesting that rebuilding the model may be warranted along with possibly investigating root causes. Uh, like data monitoring, users provide new test data sets periodically to evaluate the model accuracy metric. Now, some users uh, in some scenarios uh, may include building multiple models uh, using, for example, different algorithms or settings. And these models then compete based on their accuracy metric. This champion score, if you will, can guide which model should be used by the application. And when the metric goes below a defined alert threshold, this fact is recorded so the user can decide if the model should be rebuilt. In our first release of this coming up, OML monitoring uh, will support in database models and later will include Onyx format models as well. So that's all we have time for uh, today, but I'd like to call your attention to a few uh, OML online resources. Our OML blogs can be located uh, using the bit.ly link provided here. One of our recent blog posts discusses the top 10 reasons to use machine learning in Oracle database. Uh, for additional SQL, Python, and R code and notebook examples, check out our GitHub repository and see our library of OML office hour sessions. You know, sign up to get notifications of future events. As stated earlier, we've expanded the set of uh, example notebooks to cover all of the algorithms supported in OML for SQL and OML for Pi. And there's a new OML on autonomous database specialist certification available. Now, in support of the certification is also a new set of Oracle Learning subscription content for OML, and you can prepare for passing the certification with these. Uh, we've updated the OML for Pi workshop in our live labs environment and developed a new workshop called OML Fundamentals that highlights uh, the OML autonomous database centric components, many of which we've talked about here. So to see our recorded sessions from Oracle Database World, you know, check out this blog post. And with that, I thank you for joining this session. And as time permits, I'm happy to take questions. Mark, Mark. thank you. Very good. Um, really excellent. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, I, I sort of compare you and Philippe, who's both so passionate about your, your areas and, and the amount of information you give us is incredible. So thank you. Really great to have it. We, we do have one question here. Abby answered some of them in the, in the chat. Okay. Uh, in the, but there is one um, 
Is Auto ML only available on autonomous DB or will it be made available for 19C? This would be great to have for non-ADW installs. Absolutely. So uh, there are two ways of answering that question. If we're talking about Oracle Machine Learning for Python and the AutoML provided in that API, the answer is yes, that is available uh, both in uh, the cloud with autonomous database as well as on premises for Oracle database. And that is uh, the case for 21C. And once we release uh, OML for Pi with 19C, the AutoML capability will be available there as well. The second part though to that answer is if they mean the AutoML user interface, the, auto, the no code AutoML user interface is only available with autonomous database in the cloud. So that is not something that you can use on premises. Okay, thank you. I'm going to follow that one up, Mark. So sure. the, the amazing notebooks in the ADW, um, I answered the question when it came in was that they're currently not available on premise. That's the sad part. Is there any chance Oracle might move some of that stuff into uh, on premise deployments? Well, in terms of on premises, um, the notebooks should be available in our GitHub repository. And okay. so that would mean that if you have your own um, a Zeppelin uh, interface or a tool that can load uh, Zeppelin notebooks, that you would be able to use those. Uh, so the code is certainly there and uh, you're welcome to it. Thank you very much. Sure. So. I, I have one more question and it's a feature question. So I love the fact that we're going to be doing data drift and model drift. Like these are two concepts I, I preach about quite a lot. And, and I love the fact that we're going into that space, especially as, as people start deploying ML models. I think it's like the next thing. Is there anything for um, looking at the data and, and really alerting people when it's a very biased data set? Because this is obviously something it's very hot topic in, in just society as a whole um, is it really being aware of how we're training our machine learning models and, and not mm -hmm. giving it too much bias data. Is that something that we can see in the future? Um, I'm so glad you asked that question. I mean, the, the list of futures that I had, I wanted to constrain it to, you know, think it's a reasonable set on the slide, but yes, actually bias is definitely one of the things that our engineers are currently working on. And uh, with, any, uh, with any luck, we'll see that uh, in uh, 2022. Looking forward to it, Mark. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.